The Ways of the Buccaneers by John Macefield after John Esquemeling. Reading from Great Pirate Stories by Joseph Lewis French, as read to you by me, Mars. I think... You know, it might be fun to read these, like, using the voices from Treasure Island, kind of revisiting those characters. And if this is, like, an account of, like, the ways of the Buccaneers, like, like a study of, of pirates, I think I will, I'll go with Dr. Livesey, because he was certainly the most academic of the characters in the story. So... <clears throat> Throughout the years of buccaneering, the buccaneers often put to sea in canoas and periaguas, just as Drake put to sea in his three panaches. Life in an open boat is far from pleasant, but men who passed their leisure cutting logwood at Campeche, or hoeing tobacco in Jamaica, or toiling over grama grass under a hot sun after cattle, were not disposed to make the worst of things. They would sit contentedly upon the oar bench, rowing with a long, slow stroke for hours together without showing signs of fatigue. Nearly all of them were men of more than ordinary strength, and all of them were well accustomed to the climate. When they had rowed their canoa to the main, they were able to take it easy till a ship came by from one of the Spanish ports. If she seemed a reasonable prey, without too many guns and not too high-charged or high-built, the privateers would load their muskets and row down to engage her. The best shots were sent into the bows, and excused from rowing, lest the exercise should cause their hands to tremble. A clever man was put to the steering oar, and the musketeers were bidden to sing out whenever the enemy yawed, so as to fire her guns. It was in action, and in action only, that the captain had command over his men. The steersman endeavoured to keep the mast of the quarry in a line, and to approach her from astern. The marksmen from the bows kept up a continual fire at the vessel's helmsmen, if they could be seen, and at any gun ports which happened to be open. If the helmsmen could not be seen from the sea, the canoers aimed to row in upon the vessel's quarters where they could wedge up the rudder with wooden chocks or wedges. They then laid her aboard over the quarter, or by the after chains, and carried her with their knives and pistols. The first man to get aboard received some gift of money at the division of the spoil. Oh, that's, that's interesting. The, the, the first pirate to board the targeted vessel would get, like... A bonus. <laughs> huh, that's cool. When the prize was taken, the prisoners were questioned and despoiled. Often, indeed, they were stripped stock naked and granted the privilege of seeing their finery on a pirate's back. Each buccaneer had the right to take a shift of clothes out of each prize captured. The cargo was then rummaged and the state of the ship looked to with an eye to using her as a cruiser. As a rule, the prisoners were put ashore on the first opportunity, but some buccaneers had a way of selling their captives into slavery. If the ship were old, leaky, valueless, in ballast, or with a cargo useless to the rovers, she was either robbed of her guns and turned adrift with her crew, or run ashore in some snug cove where she could be burnt for the sake of the ironwork. If the cargo were of value, and as a rule, the ships they took had some rich thing aboard them. They sailed her to one of the Dutch, French, or English settlements, where they sold her freight for what they could get, some tenth or twentieth of its value. If the ship were a good one, in good condition, well found, swift, and not of too great draught, for they preferred to sail in small ships, they took her for their cruiser as soon as they had emptied out her freight. They sponged and loaded her guns, brought their stores aboard her, laid their mats upon her deck, secured the boats astern, and sailed away in search of other plunder. They kept little discipline aboard their ships. What work had to be done, they did. 
but works of supererogation they despised and rejected as a shade unholy. The night watches were partly orgies. While some slept, the others fired guns and drank to the health of their fellows. By the light of the binnacle, or by the light of the slush lamps in the cabin, the rovers played a hand at cards or diced each other at seven and eleven, using a pannikin as a dice box. While the gamblers cut and shuffled, and the dice rattled in the tin, the musical sang songs, the fiddlers set their music chuckling, and the sea boots stamped approval. The cunning dancers showed their science in the moonlight, avoiding the sleepers if they could. In this jolly fashion were the nights made short. In the daytime, the gambling continued with little intermission. Nor had the captain any authority to stop it. One captain, in the histories, was so bold as to throw the dice and cards overboard, but as a rule, the captain of a buccaneer cruiser was chosen as an artist, or navigator, or as a lucky fighter. He was not expected to spoil sport. The continual gambling nearly always led to fights and quarrels. The lucky dicers often won so much that the unlucky had to part with all their booty. Sometimes a few men would win all the plunder of the crews, much to the disgust of the majority who clamored for a redivision of the spoil. If two buccaneers got into a quarrel, they fought it out on shore at the first opportunity, using knives, swords, or pistols according to taste. The usual way of fighting was with pistols, the combatants standing back to back at a distance of ten or twelve paces, and turning round to fire at the word of command. If both shots missed, the question was decided with cutlasses, the man who drew first blood being declared the winner. If a man were proved to be a coward, he was either tied to the mast and shot, or mutilated and sent ashore. No cruise came to an end until the company declared themselves satisfied with the amount of plunder taken. The question, like all other important questions, was debated round the mast and decided by vote. At the conclusion of a successful cruise, they sailed for Port Royal, with a ship full of treasure such as vacuna wool, packets of pearls from the hatch, jars of civet or of ambergris, boxes of marmalade and spices, casks of strong drink, bales of silk, sacks of chocolate and vanilla, and rolls of green cloth and pale blue cotton which the Indians had woven in Peru, in some sandy village near the sea, in sight of the pelicans and the penguins. In addition to all these things, they usually had a number of the personal possessions of those they had taken on the seas. Lying in the chest for subsequent division were swords, silver-mounted pistols, daggers chased and inlaid, watches from Spain, necklaces of uncut jewels, rings and bangles, heavy carved furniture, cases of bottles of delicately cut green glass, containing cordials distilled of precious mints with packets of emeralds from Brazil, bezoar stones from Patagonia, paintings from Spain, and medicinal gums from Nicaragua. All these things were divided by lot at the mainmast as soon as the anchor held. As the ship or ships neared port, her men hung colors out, any colors they could find, to make their vessel gay. A cup of drink was taken as they sailed slowly home to moorings, and as they drank, they fired off the cannon, bullets and all, again and yet again, rejoicing as the bullets struck the water. Up in the bay, the ships in the harbor answered with salutes of cannon. Flags were dipped and hoisted in salute, and so the anchor dropped in some safe reach, and the division of the spoil began. After the division of the spoil in the beautiful Port Royal Harbor, in sight of the palm trees, and the fort with the colors flying, the buccaneers packed their gear and dropped over the side into a boat. They were pulled ashore by some grinning black man with a scarlet scarf about his head and the brand of a hot iron on his shoulders. At the jetty end where the Indians lounged at their tobacco and the fishermen's canoes rocked, the sunburnt pirates put ashore. Among the noisy company which always gathers on a pier, they met with their companions. A sort of Roman triumph followed as the happily returned lounged swaggeringly toward the taverns. 
eager hands helped them to carry in their plunder. In a few minutes, the gang was entering the tavern, the long, cool room with barrels round the walls where there were benches and a table and an old blind fiddler jerking his elbow at a jig. Noisily, the party rang about the table and sat themselves upon the benches, while the drawers, or potboys in their shirts, drew near to take the orders. I wonder if the reader has ever heard a sailor in the like circumstance, five minutes after he has touched his pay, address a company of parasites in an inn with the question, What's it going to be? The End